last segment of the introduction, which is understanding an insurance adjuster estimate. So I want to break this down for you. A lot of folks that are here watching this have already seen hundreds of insurance adjuster estimates. And some of you maybe have not seen that very many of them and, and you're uncomfortable uh, about your, your knowledge level when you read them because a lot of it may seem like it's Japanese to you. So I want to really just break down a very standard State Farm estimate that's a residential uh, job with, with a roof and some interior damages. Um, not too complicated, but it also you know is somewhat complex um, so that it has a number of different items going on. I want to be able to cover the interior work for you. And I'm going to go through it and really analyze everything start to finish, you know, with the cover page and everything that's on the cover page. There are a lot of items on the cover page that are really essential uh, for you to know. And, you know, when, when if one of your clients gives you a copy of their insurance paperwork, but they don't give you the cover letter or if they just give you the roof or any of that, that that's not going to help you. You need the whole thing. Um, so let's go through this. There's a State Farm estimate here and really on the, on the, Top cover page here, there's not a lot here. I've redacted out all the personal information, but this is pretty typical for most State Farm you know, uh, estimates that you see on the cover, you know, pretty templated information. Now, one of the things that th there is valuable he stuff here to know though, like we want you to receive quality repair work. Uh, we'll provide you with a detailed estimate of the scope of damages and cost of repairs. Should the contractor you select have questions concerning our estimate, they should contact your claim representative directly. So look at that. The, remember we talked about, you're not, you know, oh, you're not allowed to talk to the adjusters. You're not allowed, it says right there, should the contractor have any questions concerning our estimate, they should contact us directly. That should tell you something that anytime you have any questions concerning an adjuster estimate, you should be contacting them directly. <laughs> At least State Farm, right? They said it right there. Now, depending upon the complexity of your repair, our estimate may or may not include an allowance for general contractors overhead and profit. They've, they've acknowledged that. They've pointed it out. If you have questions regarding that, uh, and whether the, the general contractor services are appropriate for your loss, please contact your claim representative before proceeding with repairs, right? And that's very important. Um, there may be, and I, I say it's very important because we're going to cover when you should sub submit your estimate, when you should do your builds, and, and so I just want to, we're going to come back to that when we get to that segment. That's very important. They've already put you on notice that if you have problems with their estimate, then you need to contact them before the build. So that's very important. It's, a, it's in writing that you, you, know, it's, you should take notice. Um, there may be building codes, ordinances, laws, or regulations that affect the repairs of your property. The, these items may or may not be covered by your policy. Please contact your claim representative if you have any questions regarding coverage, which may be available under your policy. Remember that? We talked about uh, contacting the agent to find out if they had OL coverage. Um, there it is right there. So if you have a con if you select a contractor whose estimate is the same or lower than our estimate, based upon the same scope of damages, we will pay, pay based upon their estimate. If your contractor's estimate is higher than ours, you should contact us. There's a lot to be learned right there in that paragraph, right? And what they're saying is, uh, we're writing an estimate right here, and you can have this, but if you end up selecting somebody that's less, then that's all we're paying. So you should show that to your, your clients, your prospects. Like they think that they receive this estimate and they can go find you know, Johnny in a truck to get it done. I'm sorry if your name's Johnny, Johnny. Um, but they, they figure they can find somebody to get it done cheaper. But if they play it all the way out, you know, if they're not gonna give them the, all the upfront money upfront, and if they play the, whole, the, play, play the whole tape out and play that whole scenario out, then they'll see that Technically speaking, the insurance company only owes for what's actually incurred. So if you didn't incur all the expenses in the estimate, then they don't technically owe for that. So there's something to be learned in that paragraph right there. Um, but also the other uh, part is that if you get an estimate that's higher than ours, contact us. So they're letting you know there's a process for that. They're not saying that you, we'll just approve it, but contact us, right? So another, that's another indication that you are allowed to contact uh, State Farm to, to, to talk about it, but it also says prior to beginning repairs. There again, they're putting you on notice. If you have problems, let's, let's deal with that before the build and not afterwards, because you're going to give up a lot of your leverage uh, and your equity, if you will, if you go build the job first and then try to submit the estimate after the fact. Don't do that. We'll cover that. State Farm cannot authorize any contractor to proceed with work on your property 
uh, repairs should proceed only with your authorization. You know, and let's just take a moment to say that you know we're we're all up in the mix with the insurance companies, right? But technically, our contract as a contractor is with the owner of the building, right, or their agent. It's not you know like somebody that they they've hired to deal with those those uh, affairs for them. It's not ever a contract that you have with the insurance company, right? So just think about that. Like our contract is with the owner, not with the insurance company. So anytime that we decide to contact the insurance company or meet them out there or to give them our estimate paperwork and all that, all of that's just being done as a courtesy to the insurance company. So you may have to bring that out every now if things go south with an insurance adjuster. Let's let, let them know, like, hold up. My contract is with the client. And so if you're not gonna approve the damages and all that, that that's kinda on you, because my contract's with the client. And so, you know, it, it, just because you don't wanna pay for it doesn't mean that I can't charge for it. Um, and, and so this is not going very well, and so I'm gonna not talk to you anymore. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna talk with the client, because that's, that's how we have the contract. We've only just been including you as a courtesy. But I just wanna point a couple of those things out. I don't advocate being uh, rude with adjusters, but I'm just talking about if you've tried all of the, the different avenues of diplomacy and they're not working out for you and you're just getting a jerk, because there are plenty of those, then I, that, that's how I would kind of leave it. Uh, okay, let's see. State Farm does not guarantee the quality of the workmanship of any contractor. That's kind of a given. I'm hoping most of you know that. You know, if, they, if the owner makes a mistake of hiring the wrong contractor and they do a bad job, uh, it's not on State Farm. That's not their fault. Um, and, and, and I think what they're saying too is if we send out our preferred service vendors, <laughs> the PSB program maybe, that we don't guarantee that too. But that's for somebody else to figure out. So it is understood that the contractor is hired by you, our insured, and that they work for you not State Farm. I think that's what we just covered. So if you have any questions or need any information, please contact your representative. Okay, let's go on. So that's, uh, sorry to bore you through that, but that's a standard cover page. Don't ever get confused by this. This shows up, this second page here, shows up on all uh, sta State Farm claims, and it's J Joe and Jane Smith, right? So it's, a, it's a, just an example estimate that tries to help you break down which most other insurance companies don't do this. There's a lot to be learned from just this right here. You know, the line item total shows you right at the top. Um, the, the general contractor's overhead and profit, replacement cost value, depreciation, deductible, net actual cash value payment, ACV, net uh, or non-recoverable depreciation, total maximum additional amount if incurred, total amount of, of claim if incurred. See, those are the things that we're pretty much going to cover in this video. So, you know, if you want to go back and, and, and learn, watch this video, but also look at any State Farm estimate. Okay, so let's scroll on down through here, and all the personal information, like I said, has been redacted out. And this is a claim from Cincinnati, Ohio. And okay, so now let's start. We, it's going to have the claim number um, up at the top that's redacted out. We've got the insured name. Now that's good too because you may have a different name, you know, on your contract. This is the name you need to be using for your estimates. Whatever's on there, that's what you need to be using. Unless the insurance company's wrong for some reason, then you need to take it up, you know, have the owner take it up with the agent. But you've got the property uh, location, you've got the home telephone number, and then you've got the type of loss. What is it? So a lot of times it's a hail damage claim and they've got wind, or it's a wind damage claim and they've got hail. And that can be very important to know. You need to know what that is. You obviously, of course, need to know what the deductible is. Um, you need to know uh, what the date of loss is. That's also very important so that you could know what size hail or what size, you know, what, how fast or how strong the wind was when it happened. I also like to al always know what the date uh, inspected was. I want to know when the adjuster was there. I want. I mean, there's a lot of the, the, the this paperwork sort of tells the story, if you will, uh, of all the history on this claim. So the estimate is usually the same with State Farm. The number is usually the same as the claim number, which is here. Okay, you've got the policy number right here, and the price list. So this shows you what the Xactimate price list is that they were using when they wrote this estimate. That's extremely important. I mean, there's a lot of times, you know, after a hurricane or after a major event in a certain market, then those prices are going to go up. I mean, as many of you know, uh, you've probably received letters before from your suppliers notifying you that there's going to be a 5% increase or however much increase based on the supply and demand. Um, there's also like uh, tariffs and things going on with uh, 
uh, commodities, you know, steel and aluminum and things like that. Anytime there's oil uh, problems, you know, asphalt, petroleum uh, products, that, that's shingles, you know, asphalt shingles. So these things are commodity and they go up and down. Xactimate has a price list update every single month. They're, they're each month to month, the prices change. Those price lists are for different markets. So in this case here, you have Cincinnati. Well, the Cincinnati price list is going to be different from the Cleveland price list and different from the Columbus price list. So the cost to remove and replace one linear foot of baseboard is different in Cincinnati than it is in Cleveland. But it's also different in Cincinnati in February than it is in March. So if you're looking at an estimate that was written two, three months ago, you know there's a good chance that the current month that we're in, the price has gone up. Now, when does that take effect? Like, what price list should they be using? Should you be using the price list from when the storm happened, or the price list from when they inspected it, when they issued payment? Or what you know? The answer is they should use the price list of when the work is actually performed. So when the work is incurred, because remember, it's replacement cost value. Uh, policy, meaning that they pay for a new roof at what it costs to replace that roof today, at the time that it was incurred. So, you if if the if you find out like if you there's a there's a function in Xactimate where you can simply just change the price list of an estimate from February to March, and it'll show you exactly how much that change netted to. It's like it'll show you well the estimate went down twelve hundred bucks or it went up. $2,000. And so I would submit to you, um, use that to your advantage. Like if the, if it should be April, but they wrote it up in, fe in February and February is bigger than April, just leave it alone. <laughs> Stick with February. But that's important. You know, it's, it's all strategy. So you want to know right away what the price list is that they use. And that could go a long way too, like in, in explaining to your prospect when you're um, establishing yourself as the expert, like you're analyzing the paperwork and giving some commentary and breaking it down for your client so, and interpret it to, uh, interpreting it to them so that they can understand what's there. So that would be one of the issues you could bring up is, is look, ma'am, uh, and Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Jones, this price list that they're using here is outdated. So whether you, whether or not you hire me, make sure you contact State Farm. You know, you can just give them a phone call just yourself and ask them to update the price list to the most current price list. And more than likely they'll do that. And if they owe you money, if there's a difference, they'll send you a check. So don't take my word for it. Call them and ask them. That's what I would say. Um, and then so, okay, now going down, we have a summary for coverage A dwelling 35 windstorm and hail. Now, summary for coverage A. Coverage A, without getting too much into policy and coverage, coverage A is typically the structure, okay? Like the property, the dwelling. Like it says there, the dwelling. And then you have coverage B and coverage C, you know, which could be uh, other structures, it could be contents, could be other things, loss of use. There are other uh, coverage letters in the policy that refer to different things. So like everything under the dwelling has a set of standards and, and a set of um, rules that, that they go by, whereas it might be different for the unattached structures under maybe coverage B. So like for example, uh, fencing is an unattached structure and a lot of times they can depreciate that non-recoverable most of the time. You have to watch out for that. And that's one of the things that we'll cover here. So line item total, we've got the total of all the line items, and that's without sales tax, without overhead and profit, just the base line items, okay? And then all of your material sales tax, and this is gonna be, Xactimate's gonna pull from whatever your local jurisdiction is. So if there's a county uh, material sales tax that's in play, then that would be applied there. They're, they do give you some options that you have to choose from, so you are expected to kind of know the differences uh, in, in a lot of jurisdictions, and sometimes they just, there's only one or two options there. So you have the subtotal, is 5293.19, and then we have uh, general contractors overhead and profit, and that's how that looks. So if you haven't seen where they actually approved it, there it is. They do pay for it. All State Farm says, "Oh, we don't pay overhead and profit." Yes, you do. It's right here. So general contractor overhead and profit is 10% of the subtotal. Okay, uh, or close to you see the cents are off. So it's 10% of the subtotal, and the and the profit is 10% of the subtotal. So you have 20% of the subtotal uh, grand total. So replacement cost, cost value including the O&P 63.5189.
less depreciation. Now, let's stop right there. Less depreciation, do you see how it has parentheses around it? It's, so that means that it's recoverable. That's just like a little trick there. If it has the parentheses, that's a good way of knowing that it's recoverable. But if it has brackets around it, then that probably means that it's non-recoverable. So look for that, like let those stand. There's nothing more frustrating than going and doing, you know, a client's roof for them and gutters and siding windows and all these different things and interior repairs. And then you stain or you clean and you stain their fence only to find out like only 40 or 50% of that fence was being covered by insurance. And so, but you didn't find out to the end. So now you had to break it to the client. They're like, well, why didn't you know that, right? And, and, and you're like, why didn't you know that? <laughs> you know, and so that's a policy thing. Um, but somebody has to pay for it. So I think ultimately what happens a lot of times is the contractor just sort of lets that client out of it because they hate to see the whole, the whole thing go south. But it sucks, right? So you need to watch for that, those brackets and, and know when it's non-recoverable. So and now we have less general contractor overhead and profit and non-recoverable depreciation here. So what are they doing right there? What are they doing? They are taking part of the, the overhead and profit and they're depreciating it, and, but it's recoverable. So they're saying the total on overhead and profit uh, or less general contractor overhead and profit on recoverable and non-recoverable. So they're kind of, grew. it's even more confusing, right? But the key is you don't see anything with brackets there. And it might be a combination of the two so they've taken out the non-recoverable and they're only giving you the total. So you have to do the numbers and figure that out too. So now that would be almost like sneaky, you know, like, so you're used to looking for the brackets, but you don't see the brackets because they've given you the total sum of the, 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 the recoverable and the non-recoverable uh, less the GCOMP. So it can be very, very confusing. So you just have to do the numbers. And, and the other thing too is that a, lo a lot of these adjuster estimates, as you probably already know, are very, very different. You know, Xactimate is used by over 90% of the insurance companies out there. So th thankfully, that's the one you're going to see the most of. But there are other um, forms of software that they use too that are, are qu quite similar. They look very similar but they're not the same. So if you see like items being described a bit different and they're not showing, the columns aren't really showing up the same um, and you're, you're seeing different icons in it, just watch for that because that means the pricing that they're using is not the same. Um, Xactimate's gonna have the better pricing and the more recent, the more current. I found that those other uh, software programs that are used by some insurance companies always have lower price. Not always, some of the items are gonna be higher, but when you take them all and put them all together and write a complete estimate, it sure seems like you're coming up much lower um, than you would with an Xactimate estimate. So there's that. And then less the deductible, so it comes out of the first payment. So the deductible is the first thousand dollars paid to the contractor. It's not the last thousand dollars, right? But they, so they, they take that out and then the next, the net actual cash value payment. I wanna go back to that deductible for a second and just sort of give you a, a thing here. I know very well that this can be confusing with clients and you don't catch it when it's confusing because they don't believe they're confused. So uh, have you ever heard this? And I'm sure you have. If you haven't, you will, <laughs> where you're like, well, we have to get the deductible from you and it's $1,000. And they're like, well, what do you mean you have to get the deductible from me? Uh, I've already paid my deductible. And you're like, oh, you did. Well, where's the, do you have your uh, payment when you paid it to us? Because I don't have any record of where you paid us $1,000. And they're like, no, I didn't pay it to you. The insurance company took it out. They already took it out. I paid it to the insurance company. And you're like, you paid it to the insurance company. Well, do you have a payment record of where you made the payment to them? No, they took it out of the check they took it out of the check. So then you know you have a client who doesn't understand correctly what, how the deduct deductible is actually even applied, which can be surprising because, you know, it seems like people get it with uh, deductibles with auto claims and they get it with deductible or co-pays with medical. But that's how I would, I would use the medical uh, scenario, the medical example when explaining this to them. And don't be condescending, like be helpful and be understanding that they didn't, yeah, no, I understand. And you wouldn't believe how many people like don't quite get this, but actually how the deductible works, and I'm sorry to be the one to break this to you, but 
the deductible is the first thousand dollars, okay, paid to the contractor. So if your claim is ten thousand dollars, like if, if the insurance company determines that it's going to cost ten thousand dollars worth of repairs, and the contractor's charging ten thousand dollars worth of repairs, what that means is is that you pay the first thousand directly to the contractor, and the insurance company pays the other 9,000, okay? So now, and that can be compared to a doctor and a copay that you would have with a doctor. So if you have a $50 copay that you, that you have to pay at the doctor, right? And you go to see the doctor and you know that your part is 50, right? But the, and the insurance company pays for the rest. Now, how is that paid? You go into the doctor and who do you pay that to? You pay it to the doctor. And when do you pay it? Usually right in the very beginning. So you, you, the, you pay the first $50 and then the insurance company pays the rest. You pay that $50 to the doctor, the insurance company pays the rest to the doctor. Either way, all the cost of everything goes to the doctor. So in this case, in this scenario, the contractor is the doctor. So I'm the doctor. So you have to pay the first $1,000 to me, the doctor, and the insurance company will pay the other 9,000. My price is still 10, so I don't lower it down to nine just because you have a deductible. What if your deductible is five, so I'm supposed to lower it down, you know, down to five? I don't think so. So, I mean, you have to be gentle in explaining that, and again, educating your clients. But if you break it down like that, it's usually a pretty good way for them to understand it. And then the way that I would end with it, like if they don't believe me, oh, you're crazy. I paid my deductible already, right? I'm so sorry, but really, uh, maybe you did, you know, like, but don't take my word for it. Please call the agent. They'll explain to you how that works. So, and, and also maybe tell them that you have to understand that lying to an insurance company is a felony in any state, okay? And that, that's, that's insurance fraud, when you lie to the insurance company. And so there's no way really out of the deductible. Uh, you can't waive the deductible. You can't uh, pay the deductible for the client. Because see what happens is, is to, re to recover that re the recoverable depreciation, most of the time you have to submit an invoice and there has to be a certificate of completion. And so you have to disclose the amount that you charge for that project. And so if you go through and you say, well, we only charged 9,000 for that $10,000 project. And you think that just settles it. No, it doesn't because when the insurance company sees that, then they're like, you only, you only, had, you only charged 9,000? Okay, great, well, we only owe eight. You see, instead of us owing nine because you charge 10. And we're going back to the first paragraph, or the, that first letter of this insurance test, you remember how it said, you know, if you ever select a contractor that's lower than ours, then we only owe that amount. You, you get it? So the only way around that would be to lie to the insurance company and then to tell them, oh no, we charge the full 10, right? And so if you did that, that's where the felony comes in and, the, and a criminal offense. And that's, you don't want that. You believe me, you do not want to get in, in, in tied up in, on that. And also, you don't want to expose your client to something like that because they could be at risk of, of participating in that scheme. So there's no, there's no, that's not how you work with deductibles. You don't waive it. You don't pay it for your client. You don't, you don't participate in that, in that kind of action. So, but anyway, that, I just wanted to stop there with the deductible and break that down, even though it's not typically, maybe not necessarily um, relevant as much, you know, because we're breaking down insurance estimate. But I hope that'll help you. If you're not using that scenario, maybe you can use that with your clients. It'll help break it down. So now we have max, maximum additional amounts uh, available if incurred. So if so, after they break, they hold everything back. But if you do the, all the work that's listed in this estimate, then we will release the 164387, which is up here, the depreciation, that's recoverable depreciation, we'll release it back to you. We will release the 328 that we held back for depreciation that is part of the overhead and profit. We'll release that, okay, if you do the work. Uh, replacement, and also technically they won't pay the overhead and profit unless you uh, have a contractor that, you know, they, they might, they might uh, balk on you there too, or, or uh, give you some pushback on that if you don't. Uh, or they may not even notice and it never becomes an issue. But technically, technically, uh, GC overhead and profit can be an incurred item. Certain things like code upgrade items are um, uh, paid when incurred. So you might see them held back from the first payment, but once it's incurred, they don't technically owe it until those building code upgrades have actually been made. If you think about it, it makes sense. Um, so
So this is a breakdown of the item. You know, it, it can be confusing because you look at it, maximum additional amount. So you're wondering, is that in addition to everything they've paid? No, it's not. And I always look at how much is the estimate for the repairs, right? How much is the job? The job is the big number up here. I'm not saying that's necessarily big, but the biggest number here. And it's a replacement cost value, the RCV. That's the number that includes the O&P, includes the taxes. That is the cost of your job. Everything else is all hold back and withholds and everything else. So your replacement cost benefits have incurred, they'll release back up the 1972. And total amount of claim, if incurred, is 53,51,89. So they're giving you that number because that's after your deductible. So that's the total amount that they're on the hook for in this instance. So now all amounts payable are subject to the terms, conditions, limits of your policy, of course. Uh, okay, and then here's some more uh, explanation. Building replacement cost benefits. Here's the thing here, let's talk about this. Your insurance policy provides replacement cost coverage for some or all the loss or damage to your dwelling or structures. Replacement cost coverage pays the actual and necessary cost of repair or replacement without a deduction for depreciation, subject to your policy limit of liability. To receive replacement cost benefits, you must complete the actual repair or replacement of the damaged part of the property within two years of the date of loss. Now, I'm sure you've probably seen these where they say 180 days. Days, okay, and I want to point that out. You know, they're pretty lenient on that stuff. But what it means is, is if you're going to claim the recoverable depreciation, then you've got to claim it within two years. So, and some insurance companies are better than others. They'll actually reach out to you and they'll say, "Hey, we've got this uh, depreciation still in the books here. Are you going to, you know, have you made the repairs? Are you going to make the repairs? Do you need an extension?" Because they will a lot of times offer an extension if you need it. So um, I just bring that up because if you're getting to the, close to that time and you're freaking out, don't freak out. You know, if it says 180 days or it says a year or two years, a year is pretty common. Um, don't freak out. Just have the client call the, the insurance company and ask for an extension. Just let them know. They've had trouble finding contractors, but now um, they found one and they just need a little more time. They're pretty cool about those things, but you just want to pay attention because Technically, they can get you there, right? And you don't want to give them any technicalities. Um, notice within 30 days after the work has been completed, uh, confirm completion of repair or replacement by submitting invoices, receipts, or other documentation to your agent or claim office. Until these requirements have been satisfied, our payment to you will be for the actual cash value of the damaged part of the property, which may include a deduction for depreciation, which we covered. See, it's all kind of backing up what we were already talking about. Without waiving the above requirements, we will consider repla re paying replacement cost benefits prior to actual repair or replacement if we determine repair or replacement costs will be incurred because repairs are substantially underway or you present a signed contractor or contract acceptable to us. Bet you never saw that one before, right? Like if you didn't know that State Farm will release the full recoverable depreciation up front simply by presenting them with a, with a signed contract, then there you go. And if you didn't believe me, now what? <laughs> it's right there in writing on all estimates that you probably already have from State Farm. So from now on on State Farm claims, if you haven't already been doing that, I hope that you're presenting them right from the very beginning with a copy of your signed contract. So acceptable to us. Don't give them any dollar amounts on that signed contract. We've got the forms that, that we're uh, making available to you. Um, you can use those. And as you can see with the insurance uh, basic contract that we have available to you, it doesn't have any dollar amounts. That's the one that you want to use to submit to the, con to the uh, insurance company that just says that you've been hired as the contractor to perform all repairs that have been prescribed by this specific insurance claim. Again, let me just say, you, your role as the contractor is simply nothing more than to perform all repairs that have been prescribed by the insurance claim. They prescribe the repairs, you carry them out. Simple as that. Now, and you do that for the total amount of the replacement cost value. That contract, the one that we have in our, in our system here, is acceptable to State Farm. It's been used over and over and over again. So use it, put your logo on it, put your stuff on there, and make it your own. All right, now, let's just see here. 
The estimate to repair or replace your damaged property is 6351. The enclosed claim payment. So this is good too to look for because now what? You know how much money has been issued to your client. So there's no, no, no opportunity for them to play games because you know. I like to tell, you know, when I was a contractor, I like to tell the client um, how much money they have on their way. <laughs> you know, I like to be the one to notify them that so they don't think for a second that, oh, maybe he doesn't know. Maybe I'll just pay off some credit card debt with this payment that came in. So it's always a good idea to be on the same page with your client and let them know that you're up on the details and, and hopefully it's you educating them and notifying them of the details. So, all right, we, de we determine the actual cash value by deducting depreciation from the estimated repair, repair or replacement cost. Our estimate details the depreciation applied to your loss Based on our estimate, the additional amount available to you for replacement cost benefits is 1972. We've kind of covered that, so as not to be so as not to be so redundant, let's move on. All right, now this I want to get into this part here. So we're into the roof section. If you don't already know, Xactimate estimates are are basically broken down into sections, which we'll learn more about when we get into the Xactimate section, but you, in the Xactimate category of the training. So on this here. We've got, you see right at the top, a sketch of that roof. Now, if you wanna just cheat, like if you need to see something on that, I mean, you could always just up the resolution on your PDF here, but also you could just skip right all the way down to the end. There's your sketches generally. Now, most insurance estimates, on uh, Xactimate estimates, they, they usually include their sketches. And, and sometimes they don't, and I, I'm suspicious of that because maybe they're trying to hide something from you, right? But there's the interior sketch, and then there's the roof sketch right there. So if you want to get in on it and you know get get in a little close and verify some things, you want to kind of check their measurements. You know, I think that's something we don't do enough. We check their paperwork, but we don't check their measurements enough. You know, so check their measurements. The, that that one thing, like if they're off on the measurements, they could be off by twice as much. You can just throw the whole thing off. Um, you know, this this says here somewhere that the source for that is Eagle View. Um, let's go back up to the, um, I think it says that in this estimate. Let's go back up to where we were. No, it doesn't say it in this specific estimate, but you, a lot of times you're going to see that it'll tell you that the source for that sketch is Eagle View. Now, and it might not be Eagle View. With State Farm, they generally import the uh, measurements into the Xactimate. And the, another thing that they use is Insight. So that's an Xactimate. It, it's very similar to Eagle View, but um, it's, it's not Eagle View. It's called Insight. So look and see if they've said source Eagle View. But now, here's a, here's the thing that I want to tell you. Always order the Eagle View. All right? Always order the Eagle View on every job, every single one of them. And that's just, you don't, you don't have to listen to me. If you don't want to do that, don't. But again, I'm just sharing with you the way that I do things. I always order an Eagle View on any roof and or siding project. And there's a number of different reasons why I do. I'm not here to tell you that Eagle View is perfect. I'm not saying that you know, they're never gonna be off. Sometimes they're gonna be off. Sometimes they're gonna be off by a lot. So it's gonna be up to you to double check things and verify, right? Trust but verify. Um, but a couple of reasons, like even if they do use Eagle View and they import it and it says source Eagle View, and you're gonna look at it and you say, okay, Chad, I don't need to order an Eagle View on this one. And I've had many clients tell me that. You don't need to order the Eagle View because, so we don't have to wait around for you to get your Eagle View to get the estimate um, because State Farm wrote it and it says right there they have Eagle View and they even have a sketch in there. You're not gonna need an Eagle View at all. Guess what? I'm gonna need an Eagle View because here we go at the top. This gives you sort of a breakdown, summarized version of the items on this roof. So it's giving you the 2036.10 uh, surface area. So that's basically 20.36 squares. It's giving you total perimeter length. That's where you get your drip edge, right? Your, your rakes and your eaves all put together. Um, assuming there are rakes and eaves. So 296.12 for that. And then your total hip length. So you know from this that there's 21.26 linear feet of uh, hip caps that are gonna be necessary, uh, hip ridge caps. So, and then we have over here along that line, ridge, there's your ridge. Ridge plus hips gives your hip and ridge caps, right? Number of squares, 2036. Now, what's missing though? Aren't there some things missing from that breakdown that you can get from Eagle View, Eagle View but you're not seeing there? 
Yes, like you're not seeing um, Valley Metal, for example. Where's the Valley Metal? So how am I gonna get my Valley totals if I don't get an Eagle view and if I don't measure it um, just from looking at a State Farm estimate? It's not gonna happen. I, I, I've ran a virtual estimate writing company for many years and I know this frustration more than most. It's just not gonna happen. You're not gonna get the value. Now, can you get a Google map thing up and start drawing on it? Sure, you can do all that, but listen, when they ask you where you got your Valley Metal totals from, are you gonna tell them you drew it on a Google? No, you're gonna say, I got it from Eagle View. And they say, great, send us a copy of the Eagle View. Why? Because Eagle View is the number one most recognized source of aerial measurement data in the insurance restoration industry. That means that it's an acceptable, the most acceptable standard to the insurance companies. That's why I'm gonna use it, I'm playing the whole tape. I need to get my valley measurements, but I also need to prove the valley measurements. So um, that, that's why I need it. Um, it's also not giving you um, many other factors, not giving you the pitch. It's not giving you the pitch. Oh my goodness, like let's look through here. Like a lot of these estimates, you'll see that they don't even have a steep charge at all. Well, probably the reason for that is because they don't even know how steep it is because their janky system doesn't give them the full Eagle View report, which gives them the, the pitches and the whole nine yards, right? And it's gonna give you a lot of other data that you're gonna need. So I'm gonna, and also flashing. Eagle View gives you a breakdown on the flashing. Uh, Eagle View gives you a breakdown on the step flashing. Those are going in every single one of my estimates. Why? Because flashing must be replaced where rusted, damaged, or deteriorated. It's a building code uh, requirement, which comes in the next segment. Stay tuned. So I'm just going to get an Eagle View every single time, and I'm not going to concern myself with little nickel and dime expenses. Don't shortchange yourself on things like this. Um, there's a lot of reasons why you want to get an Eagle View every single time. Now, I'm not like the biggest um, roof sketcher, you know, with, the, with Xactimate, uh, which you'll see, and I'm gonna share with how I do things. I mean, I know how to do a roof sketch, but I, I'm not, uh, I, I don't like to import those things in. You know, I know they're easy to do, but we're missing items, we're missing things. And so again, I wanna keep that competitive edge, and I'm gonna go through each and every one of them, um, you know, when, when, I, when I include my items item by item. I'm going to do it honestly every single time. And so, okay, now let's dive into this roof a little bit. Um, and, and I'll just say one more thing about the sketch up top that when we get into some interior, we'll see the summarized uh, breakdown in, in those sections also, which we'll get to. So, all right, now remove, tear off, haul, and dispose of comp shingles three tap. Thing you need to understand is in Xactimate, if you already know, that there's an item for includes haul away, um, that's this one right here, um, and there's an item no haul off, okay? Now, no haul off would mean right away by default that we're gonna need a dumpster. However, when you see this, this remove, tear off, haul, and dispose, right away so many adjusters, because they're using that item, they won't put a dumpster at all into the uh, estimate. You need a dumpster into the estimate because even if you're just doing a roof, because if you really go and look at the item for the removal of the shingles, and you go look at that item, the, like you go look at the uh, illustration, right? You go look at the, the description on that item. It says that it includes removing and hauling off the shingles and the felt. It doesn't say the drip edge and the valley metal and the step flashing and the flashing, and it doesn't say um, the ridge caps, it doesn't say the, any of those other things, vent caps and flashing and all that. Now I get it that you're not gonna need as big of a dumpster if you're just talking about those things, but um, it's not included. <laughs> Dumping for all those other items is not included just because you use that item. You know, you, 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 you don't get to include dumping of drywall and insulation just because you use that, uh, that item on number one. So I just want to point that out. Like, like you still need a dumpster. You still need a dump truck or something. You still need it. So, and then, and then furthermore, if, if you really want to get technical, it says that this item is used when the contractor is using their own hauling equipment. You know, so there's some judgment calls be made in that too. So, I mean, if you really want to break it down, okay, so what if they're not using their own equipment, but they're using that item? 
um, and it says if a dumpster is required. So the dumpster is required, but aren't they already paying a certain portion towards the dump with that item? So I just try not to get too carried away on all of the little nickels and dimes, okay? Like I'm, I'm, I'm gonna keep it, I wanna, I wanna document every single thing that's there and have everything there, but, but when it comes to like the dump stuff, I, I mean, I'm just gonna make a judgment call. I'm not gonna say, oh, well, there's so many tons, because you can break it down by the tons, but I'm, I'm gonna make a judgment call and go with it, because it's just an estimate. So if the adjuster doesn't agree with it, we can reduce it, and if more is needed, we can revisit that issue, which we'll get into some of that stuff later. Um, okay, now, let's look here. We've got remove that, and then we have three tab 25 year shingles right away. So we have remove 7.95 squares, and we have replace uh, nine. So let's, let's look at that, you know, waste factor there. Um, okay, so the, the waste factor that they're using, it looks like there's about 10%. I mean, 10% would be 8.745, you know, rounded up to nine, um, because you really can use 8.7. So it looks like they're using a 10% waste factor there. Now, let's look at that roof. Do you think 10% is gonna cut it on that? I don't think 10% is gonna cut it. That, that looks like at least 15%. That sucker's all cut up. So now they're not covering the whole thing. They're just covering part of it. So I have to give them a little credit there. Um, they, they ultimately did cover the whole thing because they needed to, but this is their first version of the estimate. So you can see there's 20.36 squares, but they're only covering 7.95. So they're only covering, you can tell, a certain amount. Their removal charge for additional, for steep roof, 10 to 12, uh, 10, 12 pitch to 12, 12 pitch. There's five squares of that, 5.18. So they're removing 5.18 and they're replacing six squares. Now, that's actually done the correct way, which is hardly ever done with adjusters. You know, so that, that's actually done correct. They usually, first of all, you're lucky if they even include the removal of the steep, and, and then you're even more fortunate if they have that and waste on the, on the replacement portion, because that's how you're supposed to do it. That's how we train to do it. Um, the two-story roof here, okay, it's got a two-story here, but he, I noticed right away it doesn't have any kind of high charge. You're saying you got a two-story roof, but you're not paying for the high charge. So there should be a removal high charge, replacement high charge there, um, even if it is just 10 shingles, which he has here. And then you have an additional, additional labor to rep repair the, the left slope. So, but, but there's nothing else in this estimate. There's not any drip edge, there's no valley metal, there's no, there's no accessories, there's nothing in here. So one of the things I wanna show you too is, now, now let me go and cut away and let me go show you another estimate, just real briefly, because it, that, it'll give you an example of what I'm talking about here that's not on the assessment we've been looking here. Let's look here, we've got valley metal, we've got continuous ridge vent aluminum, we have drip edge. Now, if you know that those items are required, and look, W profile painted valley metal. If you know those items are required, then you're like, oh good, man, the insurance company actually covered it. Like, those items are there, so we know, you know, we have the money, to, we don't have to fight for those things. But look, it's not covered. It's not. So you're seeing Valley Metal W profile painted. You're seeing continuous ridge vent and drip edge. But what's missing? You should be seeing R&R &R Valley Metal. You should be seeing R&R &R continuous ridge vent aluminum. You should be seeing R&R &R drip edge, right? Aren't you? You know that. Now that I just said it, <clears throat> you've looked at enough of these to, to know that you see that a lot. You see R&R. &R. You see R and R turtle vent. You see R and R flashing pipe jacks. So why is the R and R not in front of that? Um, you need. To, it's not just because it's a different insurance company or it's a different, you know, type of estimating software. It's Xactimate. So what you need to, when you see that, the first thing you do when you look at a roof estimate or any estimate is not only look to see if the items are there, but then look to see if the R and the R is there. So what they're saying to you is is that they're gonna pay to replace. If there's no R&R &R there and nothing else, then that means that's a replacement item, okay? Otherwise, if it was detach and reset or install only or something like that, it would say that, but it doesn't, so it's replacement only. But it's not paying you 
for the removal of that item. And, and why not? Well, and the adjuster says, well, we don't pay for the tear-off because that's all included in the tear-off of, uh, of the shingles. No, it's not. Again, go back to the illustration and Xactimate. It's not included in the tear-off of the shingles. It only includes the shingles and the fell. And so a lot of times I'll tell an adjuster, now I give you, Mr. Adjuster, it doesn't say anything about the nails, and I'm pretty sure they mean to include the nails, but they don't mean to include all those other things. And one of the ways we do it, which you'll see in we, the way we structure it, is we start the estimate by remove, remove, remove. Remove the, the uh, ridge caps, remove the shingles, remove steep, remove high, and do remove, 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 and then do the R&R &R of all the accessories sandwiched in the middle, and then replace, 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 replace with everything else, with with waste and, and replace the, the ridge caps, seal paint, drip edge, all those things which we'll get into further when we're, when we're talking about how to structure the estimate. But we like to break those out in the order of the job to show them where they're wrong, to show them, So because I think they just try to sneak it in there, like nobody's going to know, right? I think they train their adjusters to do like that, that. Because do you think the homeowner or the business owner is going to recognize that? They're not going to notice that if they even know what drip edge is at all. But if they know what drip edge is, like let's say they've been savvy and they've been interviewing some contractors, they've been learning about the materials on their home, or maybe it's a, a, a guy that's a fixer upper guy, he knows building materials, he knows what drip edge is, he's going to be the first guy that falls for that. He's going to say, oh, well, drip edge, they're paying for that, honey, look, they got us everything we need. So they don't. So you need to be looking for the R and the R. I think that's one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to have this segment uh, to, to go through that, really, because that's one of the most common things that people miss and they don't catch. I talk to my clients all the time, I'm like, look, and I tell them about that, I say, pull up one of your State Farm estimates. Do they have the drip edge there? Yep, they have the drip edge there, but do they have it on there? Is everything right about that drip edge? Looks good to me. You know, so many people in my experience are missing that. They didn't catch it, so hopefully that provides some value to you there. All right, now let's go on down. Um, wrong estimate, let's go back to the estimate we were on. All right, let's go down past the roof. We've got the, generally underneath each section, as I said, you got the breakdown up top, and then you have the totals for that section, okay? And let's look at these, co these columns. We've got quantity, unit price, tax, GCONP, RCV, age life condition, depreciation percentage, and ACV. Now that's crucial, right? So the, we, and over here in the quantity, that you show, see down here how many, that's pretty self-explanatory, and then the unit price, how much each one costs. So per square, it's 4157 here. And then any of the tax. Why don't we see tax on the removal, the removal portion? Because at the end of this estimate, they're only, and we saw that in the beginning too, they're only applying tax on material sales tax. And there is no material on the removal portion, so it's not there. So we have the GCO and P is uh, 6610, and a lot of these estimates won't show the O and P in the same column. So some of them are broken, they give you a different type of a breakdown, so you have to watch for that. RCV, that's the replacement cost value, so that gives you the total, the high number, the total cost of the 7.95. That is the big number, that's the cost. Now you go in and you see, is now, they can't depreciate, they're not supposed to, they're not supposed to depreciate any labor items. So like labor only items, I should say. So removal of the shingles is not depreciated, right? Removal of the steep charge, not depreciated. Removal here, removal here. The only thing that has any depreciation on it is the actual item with materials. And there should probably be some depreciation here too, but they didn't get too carried away. But technically they could put it there too because there's materials right there. So uh, on the uh, replacement of the sh 10 shingles. Um, but not the labor of the roofer. There should be no re a replacement or uh, depreciation applied to that. So, but when it is applied, it's applied to replacement items that have materials, okay? So, and, and how that's done is based on the age. So, the adjuster came up with 18, 18 years old of a 25-year value item, like it's made to last 25 years, what he's saying. So, 18, he's saying it's 18 years old, he got that information from somewhere. Now, he, usually an adjuster will ask the property owner, how old's your roof? 
you know, and you don't even know why they're asking that, but that's why. They're trying to, they, they, see the contractor doesn't have to come up with that information typically, but that's one of the things about adjusting that you don't do, you're not an adjuster. But adjusters have to do that. They have to uh, come up with other things and go a little bit beyond just the estimate. There it is right there. Now, if you see that the depreciation is huge, like within, in this case, you know, the, the, the cost for the shingles is $2,284, but 1,600 of it is being held back. That's because they're depreciating it by 72%, which Xactimate calculated that figure based on the fact that the materials are 18 years old. That's how they came up with that. So <clears throat> if you ever have a need to get that number, what I would do is just submit my, my signed contract or just contract to State Farm and it's done, right? We don't have to deal with that. But you know, going to that, you might, I always would give my, my signed contract to every insurance company and ask every single one of them to go ahead and release the depreciation. And State Farm and Chubb, as I said, MetLife, you know, even USAA, there's a lot of them that are going to go ahead and just do that right up front. But then there's a lot of other ones that are going to be like, <laughs> we give you the depreciation when the work is done. Who do you think you are? Like, it's like they didn't even understand that technically they should be doing that. Um, so with those folks, maybe the, from a cash flow position, it, it makes it too difficult to get the job going. Um, or, you, you know, the homeowner doesn't have the money and so whatever. So you might go back to the insurance company and say, hey, look, they've applied 18 years on this roof in air, but we come to find out it's only 16 years old, or it's only six years old. So, you know, it may be, it might behoove you to go back, you know, if there's a whole lot of items on the job, or hey, if it's an ACV policy job, right? And you're not ever getting any depreciation, then it becomes a big deal that age, right? So I just want you to understand that because there might be scenarios where you need to actually go through and do the research and find out just how old really all that stuff is. You know, if they say, how old's your house? And they say, well, the house is 20 years old or the house is 10 years old, right? Um, that doesn't mean that all the building materials inside the house is 10 years old. What if they remodeled their kitchen or their, or their bathroom? You know, so, or if they had a new roof put on a few years ago. So these adjusters are moving so fast and they're in such a hurry to get it done and close out the estimates. So you have to understand too, you think that the adjusters are intentionally shorting people, and some of them are, but I, I've been around a lot of adjusters. I had adjusters that have worked for me you know, as estimate writers, and I've studied them. I've really gotten to, to see how they, how they tick, right? And what I've learned is, is that when an adjuster is brand new, they're real energetic, and they're excited, and they're gung-ho, and they're thinking about the money they could make from their first deployment, like when they can go. Now, all of them really want to go and settle in with a nice staff adjuster job and stay home. Some of them want to go out and hit the road, but, but a lot of them want to have a career at home and be have a solid you know, career with like a state farm or, or something like that. But when you just become an adjuster, you're not getting that job. Like you have to work your way up to that. And one of the things you have to do is you have to have a deployment or two under your belt or several, which means that you have to have gone out and traveled and been dispatched out to out of town to where a storm is, stayed in a hotel, wrote up a bunch of estimates and gotten through that. And when you first come out of your little adjuster school and you learn how to you know, use exact, I mean, you've done all this in just a few days, you know, you've rushed your way through. And by the way, they want anybody to be an adjuster right after a major hurricane, especially after Harvey and Irma. Because after Harvey, there was a major shortage with as vast as it was. Um, and, there, and you can only have a certain type of adjusters who are flood certified, certified to work in the um, flood ravaged areas of, of the greater Houston area. And so it was a really strange dynamic where there wasn't enough adjusters. And then shortly after, just a couple weeks later, all of a sudden Irma's coming, and they're already short, and now they need even more. But they have to respond to every claim that's filed by so many days by statute, and they're held to that standard. So they've got to rush out there, and they have to have somebody on the ground. And so because they know they have, they're going to get somebody. And, and as 
you know, through that process, there's a lot of subpar adjusters that are recruited, new adjusters made and rushed through the process. Now, going back to the gung-ho new adjuster, when he goes out there, he or she is thinking, I'm going to make a ton of money because I've learned how to use Xactimate. I know how to do it, so I know how to write a proper Xactimate estimate. They go out, they start writing up estimates the proper way, the way they were taught how to do it. They submit it, and then the examiner or the inside desk adjuster turns it down and shoots it right back to them. Now that's a problem because they did it correctly, but the examiner's like, no, 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 we don't, we don't pay for the replacement item, or for the removal items, even though they've been taught how to do it correctly. But no, we don't pay for that. So take that off. Um, no, we don't pay for the waste on the, the, on the steep. No, we don't pay more than 10% waste, even though it's all cut up. We're only gonna stick with 10%. No, we don't pay for any code items, just out of pocket, right? And so, or just right out of the gate. And so the, that adjuster's like, man, that sucks. You know, like, I know I've been taught, like, it's the, according to Xactimate, they are supposed to do it, but they're not doing it. But the biggest problem, personally, for that adjuster is usually they don't get to their paycheck until it's been closed out, okay? So if, if, if they're making mistakes in the very beginning, that's usually like their career, is they go rushing out there and, and they are doing it correctly, turning it in, but it's holding up the pay. So they find out and learn very quick what the insurance companies don't want. Can you understand that? See, it's not that the adjuster was some cold-hearted jerk that just wanted to go out there and screw everybody over. No, it's that they're thinking about themselves and their livelihood and their families and being able to survive and get those checks flowing in when they've been living on their credit card at these hotels and waiting for like a month for the checks to start trickling. You know, they're thinking they're gonna get their checks in like a couple weeks and then they find out that it's a month. And then they find out the checks are much lower because the things that they were writing up. So then they, they find out quickly that the real game is speed. It's not quality, it's speed. You wanna know why, why that is? Another reason why that is, is because after a big deployment like that, another thing they're excited is that the carrier is just burying them with files, with assignments, okay? But there's a caveat to that. If those assignments are not closed, then they're gonna be yanked from the adjuster and given to someone else. Because remember, they must get there. They have to get there, no matter what. So they have checks in place that's gonna come back to the adjuster and pull them from that adjuster if, if, if they're not you know, done right away. So speed is the game. And what happens though, bear with me now, after a hurricane, if they must get there within so many days to every single claim, and they go on a, recru a recruiting spree and deploy every adjuster they can possibly get their hands on, and every one of those claims will, not should, but will have an adjuster show up and do an estimate no matter what. After they've all been visited, now what happens? For that adjuster that just came through the adjuster training and went out of town that's on the, the credit card and they're on the hotel, what happens to the adjuster now? Cut. They get cut. Go home. We're done with you. We don't need you anymore. Whoa, right? Like they were just now learning how to do this thing, just getting into their stride. They just now finally figured out that it wasn't laboring through and diligent diligently through estimates and doing them correctly and thorough and, and accurate the way they were taught, but it's turn them and burn them, right? As quick as you can get through them. So then, then you quickly learn that, oh my goodness, I gotta get as many of them as I possibly can get done. But, and, and I gotta just make sure that I don't have anything on here where it's gonna flag something and it's gonna kick back down and I'm not gonna get paid and it's gonna get delayed and the homeowner's gonna be upset because they're not gonna get their payment because the payment's not gonna be processed. And so for a lot of reasons and those that I've just mentioned included, the adjuster quickly finds out that the game is not quality, it's speed and their livelihood depends on it. 
Now that's their first deployment. What about the second deployment? Second deployment, they know firsthand. Like they know right out of the gate what the game is because they've always lived with the regret of knowing now that they know how things go, they wish they would have played it that way from the beginning, from the very first assignment, from the first deployment, right? So the second time, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. I'm not, I'm not gonna fall for that this time. This time, I'm gonna have myself set up. And this is where they start getting creative and they start building themselves desks in the back of their truck, you know? Cause they don't wanna, they're like trying to figure out how can I get there, write it, you know, do everything on the spot. Or maybe I'm gonna do all my inspections and do a whole bunch of them and then sit in my hotel room for two days straight and burn through a bunch of estimates. Like there's, everybody has their own kind of, it is like a game, who could be the most efficient? You know, and it's all about efficiency. So then they start getting prepared and they start getting themselves, you know, special devices and, and laptop and, and quick Wi-Fi out in the field, you know, they're not going to fall for that again. You know, they're going to, they're going to get their assignments, get out there early in the morning when it's cool. You know, so, th so see, now when you start to think about some of those things, it's really not, you know, if you're, if you're really thinking, um, you know, which is empathy, thinking, you know, trying to picture it for, through someone else's shoes. I can help you in a lot of ways in business and in life and not just here. I think you should try that out in a lot of areas of your life and business and see how it works. But especially this one, try to actually put yourself into the shoes of the nemesis, the insurance adjuster. And then maybe you can be a little more empathetic and understanding of where they're coming from. And so it's not that they're trying to screw you over every time, it's speed is the game. And so now you, are the you know the antidote to that speed game because you need to not be like the adjuster and be in the rush and do the same thing that they're doing because contractors are doing that same thing they're not taking their time doing the photos and the inspections they're not taking their time to check these insurance uh, estimates correctly, to look for the obvious flaws, to look for the non-recoverable depreciation on the other structures, to look for the bad depreciation deals, to look for the mismeasurements. I mean, a lot of these estimates, you'll look at it, went all the way through auditing and, and through like three different four checkpoints, and you look at it, and there's like a line item that says ice and water shield, zero. <laughs> like, they messed up and they didn't mean to put zero, but nobody caught it. And a lot of times, even the contractor didn't catch it. Yourself probably included. I know myself included. And so you're going to be diligent. You're going to take your time and you're going to check everything. So let's go on down. So now we, we go from the roof. And this is usually how I like to do my estimates too in this order. I mean, from the section standpoint, I want to go from, you know, the roof. And then I want to go front elevation. Mine's a little different. I go front, right, rear, left but I wanna do the elevations then, but this uh, adjuster did front elevation here, and he indicated no, he or she, I don't, I don't know if it was he or she, uh, indicated no storm, storm damage here, and so they didn't bother putting the measurements into the elevations there. Um, and then left elevation, you know, it's almost better if they just left out the elevations rather than putting in elevations and saying no storm damage. I find most of the time they do that, they didn't even check. <laughs> because I go find the storm damage. But left elevation, no storm da no damage. Right elevation, detach and reset gutter, downspout aluminum up to five. Now I see a problem with that right away because anytime I'm gonna detach and reset gutters, I'm gonna have to paint them. Oh, why? Because they're already white. Or, or why? Because they have, a, they have a baked on finish. Why would you do that, Chad? You don't need to do that. Uh, yes, I do because they're gonna be scratched after you detach and reset them. So they're gonna need to be painted. Uh, rear elevation, no damage. Okay, now let's start moving into interior work. Now, the sketch again is right up here, so you can see what the measurements are. And again, if they're too small for you, just cheat and go on down to the end. We're on the master bedroom right there, that, so you can see you know bigger there what the measurements are. And going back up. Around the middle bedroom there, sorry. Um, okay, now, the sections here, we've got a breakdown again. And I like these things here, because we've got, these can be very, very helpful. Um, we have the total square footage of all the walls in the room, 498.67. We have total square footage of the ceiling, over here on the right, 209.82. And then we have the total square footage of the walls and the ceiling. And then we have the total square footage of the floor, 
we have the linear foot ceiling perimeter, linear foot floor perimeter. Give you a couple examples where this, is, where this comes in handy. Square foot um, walls, if we're just painting all the walls, we know how, how much there is there. We don't have to measure them. Um, we know, and, and you know, just build the sketch and put in your missing walls and doors, and it gives you all this information. So, and we'll get into that sketch a little bit later. So, we have um, 62.33 linear foot ceiling perimeter. That would be useful if you're just painting the ceiling and you're not painting the walls, then you need to tape along the, the, the perimeter of the ceiling. So that gives you that. And then you have over here, uh, 20982 floor. That would be like mask and cover the floor. That'd be good for that. Uh, final cleaning at the end, um, which you'll see in our estimates. Final cleaning residential or commercial, that's per square foot. That's where you get that number. Um, and then like, why do they have ceiling and floor? Because the ceiling could be different if it's like a slope ceiling or a, or a peak ceiling or tray ceiling or something it could be different from the floor. So basically the linear foot of the perimeter of the floor is different from the linear foot feet of the perimeter ceiling um, because of the cuts that are in the doors. So we're talking about like baseboard stops at the doors, um, but also shelving. So that's a good, so if you're looking for a good um, number on that breakdown to come up with the measurements of baseboard, or shelving, that would be the one you want. Crown molding would be for uh, perimeter sealing and um, taping it off. So I find that that's a pretty good way to break down a room, is go to that section and you can kind of get your necessary measurements. So if the adjuster is just missing a few things, like he has, um, so here, I would just look at this estimate, and the adjuster's got remove and replace, one sheet basically of drywall because 32 square feet it's eight by four is 32 square feet um, so that's one sheet uh, he's got remove and replace drywall remove and replace 32 square feet of insulation and then he wants to seal the surface area um, like a primer a kills uh, 60 square feet to blend into the damaged area and then paint just that area right there one coat and then paint the whole ceiling. So, he, and then mask and cover the floor to protect the floor, and then content manipulation uh, charge one hour. So he's, he's mostly correct about that painting part, but see what he's missing out is, he's got mask and cover the floor here, but if you're truly gonna take out one sheet from the ceiling, then you're also, then you're just painting the ceiling, then you're also gonna have to mask and tape along the ceiling perimeter. So that's missing. And then I would also assume, you know, from this, it's a bedroom. I mean, it has at least a light fixture in that bedroom. It's got at least an HVAC register. More than likely, it probably has a ceiling fan. I'm not gonna go into the photos on this estimate because we're just breaking it down. But those are the things that are missing. So I'm looking there and I'm seeing it's probably missing a smoke detector. You know, and then by the way, if that one sheet, if that water spot that's causing them to take out that one sheet, if that's close to the wall or touching the wall, then you're gonna have to also paint the wall. And not just one wall, but all the walls in that room in a continuous run wherever it leads to. And so then if you're painting the walls, then you're detaching and resetting uh, shelves, towel bars, mirrors, toilet paper holders, you know, if you're like in a bathroom, um, pictures, shelves, those kind of things, and then blinds. So door stops. So there's other other things that you'd be doing on the walls. And I've seen so many times where they're just quite frankly missing the walls when they should have the walls. If it's if it if the water spot is even close to the wall, you're ripping out the drywall and you're you're inadvertently going to damage the paint on the wall also, which is why you have to paint. It's pretty much standard in the industry. Um, another thing that's missing here is applying antimicrobial agent. Um, after you tear out the drywall and the insulation. That's another pretty standard item there to, to essentially spray down the ceiling joist, any, any of that ex uh, contaminated area where it had the water damage to prevent new mold growth. And so again, um, you don't necessarily need to even estimate it this way. With the remove and replace drywall, you could take the removal portion of the drywall, of the insulation, all out of the water mitigation category. So um, there, there are several things that I can tell right away just from looking at that that are missing. And the way that I would probably do it 
uh, depending on what the texture is on on the ceiling, I mean, we have to deal with that texture. So just just know that if it's popcorn texture, then the whole ceiling has to come off. So if it's acoustic popcorn texture, then you'd have to use an item to scrape the entire ceiling after detaching and resetting all the fixtures, um, and then remove the 32 square feet of drywall, remove the insulation, uh, apply my antimicrobial agent, and then replace the insulation, replace the drywall, and then re replace uh, the texture for the whole ceiling. So you would have scrape um, the whole ceiling minus that 32 square feet because you're removing the drywall so you would need to scrape it, and then reapply the texture to the whole ceiling. Um, so that's the way it's done. You don't just match that popcorn in. And it's pretty complicated to do it on other textures too. So you have to kind of use your best judgment. It, after all, remember, it's just an estimate um, when, you, when, you, when it's pre-built. So if, you know, if there's any kind of a pushback from adjusters, then you can go along with what they say, um, but we're, we're not going to really know for sure what it really is until, after, until when we're actually swinging hammers. So one of the things I would say is, a, okay, Mr. Adjuster, you think that it's uh, 64 square feet and I think it's 128 square feet. Um, we're going to try to follow your prescription at the 64 as long as you're okay with revisiting it after it's no longer a hypothetical and it's just an estimate but when we're actually swinging hammers and it becomes an actual. As long as you're, you know, we're, we're willing to withhold that as long as you're willing to revisit at that time. And of course they are. So, um, but like knockdown texture and even like orange peel and other kind of textures, there's a, a texture in the drywall section for you know, drywall texture and then heavy texture um, and then machine uh, applied texture. So like a light texture. Um, so there's, there's multiple different textures, but depending on what it is, you may need to scrape off the entire ceiling and reapply the entire texture. But I would start by trying to, you know, put new texture into that affected area and blending in with the rest, but not if it's popcorn. For sure not if it's popcorn. Okay, so let's move down to this next, um, let's see, we've got the middle bedroom closet. See, like in this room, it looks like we've got the walls to deal with. So with no walls in the bedroom, but walls to deal with in the uh, closet. And I would say also, I'd try to get two coats of paint in there. If I was doing that estimate, I would do two, co two coats all across the whole ceiling instead of one. I know he has one, but I would try to do two. I'm not saying that that would get approved, but I would try to seal the affected area like they have and then paint two coats. Um, but I know most of them are only going to pay for, for the way he has it. But I'm going to try it. I'm going to start there. So middle bedroom closet, we're going to paint the walls, detach and reset the baseboard, eight feet of that, stain and fi finish all the baseboard, and I think it's all the baseboard, 2904 linear feet. Uh, linear for perimeter is 2904. Yep, that's what the adjuster is saying. See, that's what's good to be able to understand the top section there. So like you're looking through and you're seeing, okay, he said 29.04. Is that all of it? Yep, he's saying all of it needs stain, but only eight feet of it needs detached and reset, and none of it needs replaced. That's the take of the adjuster. But then we have other trim board that needs to be detached and reset again, not replaced, and then all the trim being painted. So now we have uh, wallpaper over here and we have uh, prep the wall for wallpaper. So remove and replace wallpaper and again you could do uh, remove wallpaper out of the water mitigation category. Um, that could be uh, uh, you know technically if there's water if it's wet then that's what you'd want to do. And notice how on the drywall it's half inch on the walls and 5 8 inch on the ceiling. And that's something that adjusters don't get correct a lot of times, but they did get it correct here, so that's good. So it's not half inch on the ceiling. It's typically almost always 5 8 inch. All right, now wallpaper, remove and replace. Mass the floor, content. So again, I mean, we're missing a lot. We're missing probably drapery, hardware. Uh, well, not in a closet, but uh, probably shelves. In a closet, we're missing shelves. Uh, detach and reset shelves. And that's probably the trim board that they referred to. Let's see. Detach and reset trim on the middle and top and back sides of the closet wall to allow for drywall and wallpaper replacement. No, that's not what they are referring to. So they're missing the shelves. Shelves, detach, reset, and paint. 
that's what I'd try to get on there and start there and go back from there. Um, all right, back bedroom, uh, crown molding, 16 linear feet, which is not the entire ceiling perimeter. Paint crowd molding, 5783, which is. So 16 linear feet needs damage. So that would tell me right away, I'm assuming before looking any further, that we should be dealing with the walls and the ceiling. And we're gonna, we're gonna, if we're removing crown molding and replacing it, even detaching and resetting it, we are painting the ceiling and the walls. So let's see, do they have that right? Negative, they do not. They have 36 here blend into the damaged area. No, they don't. They don't have any walls, so that's incorrect. The walls need painted also. So if the walls need painted, everything on the walls needs to detach and reset. So right away, just looking through here, we can see a lot of the problems um, just before we even really dig in. The only way to really know those is to do a proper inspection and do a ton of photos and build a proper estimate and just let the chips fall where they may. All right, so the kitchen, detach and reset eight feet of the crown molding. We know that there's 53.46 uh, linear feet on the ceiling, but they only went Eight feet detached and reset, stain and finish. Again, drywall, that's half inch, so that would be the wall they're saying that we gotta do. Wall, insulation, detach and reset the casing. See, detach and reset casing and paint around the casing and detach and reset shelving, right? Those are all the things that should have been in the other room, but they're not. Uh, deducted cabinet surface areas and paneling on one wall from the painting surface, I, I can, I can dig it, <laughs> but I would go with uh, two coats, and I would go with taping all along the baseboard, all along the casing, the doorways, the windows. You got to tape all that stuff, right? So I would get it in the estimate and start from there. So lots of items missing. And so again, you know, I see that you're dealing with all the walls here, Mr. Adjuster, but you started out the room with detaching and resetting eight linear feet of crown molding. So you have to paint the ceiling. You're missing the ceiling in this room, no question about it. Just double check. Yep, it's not there. Totally missing. Incorrect. So again, going back before what I was saying about, about some of you roofers, like why don't you do the interior work? It's not just patch and paint and get out of there. I mean, so it's pretty profitable to be inside of there and it's almost always a trigger uh, for overhead and profit. If you're on the inside dealing with drywall and insulation and all of that, um, you better have overhead and profit. And State Farm paid overhead and profit on everything. And I know that like uh, Safeco and Liberty Mutual are currently, as of the airing of this, are, are you know withholding overhead and profit on most jobs, but even when they pay it, they're not paying it on roofing related items. Well, let's go backwards a little bit hate to back up, but I want to go back to the roof. And the overhead and profit is actually included in the roof. So it's not, it's not reasonable or fair for Safeco and Liberty Mutual to be able to get by with that. But currently, you know, you have to play hardball. You know, so you have to uh, do things the hard way. It's really hard to take on Safeco and Liberty Mutual claims these days, but it is what it is. And we just kind of have to roll with the punches until the trends change more in our favor as far as that's concerned, so. All right, and then uh, going back to the back bedroom, kitchen, so replace word stenciled on the exterior wall, painter, one hour, may need more than that. Another thing I'm noticing missing from all these interior rooms, which you always want to use, is pretty standard is the item, uh, the code is CLN is the category, and it's the code is final R, which is in the cleaning category, final residential. And if it's a commercial job, it's, it's just final. It might be final C. So it's a com for a commercial per square foot. So it's just cleaning per square foot, and, it, and it's, you do that for the floor square footage. You just pop it right at the very end, which you'll see in some of our estimates. Now let's look at this, the debris, from, <laughs> you remember we were talking about the debris removal in the dumpster, and I said you're going to have to have a dumpster on this, um, and you know, 
So we've got one pickup truck load. So I get that the, that the shingles are supposedly included with the tear off of the shingles and the felt. Okay, but nothing else. Guess he didn't really put much else on the roof. <laughs> but everything else that's on that roof has got to come off. Um, the drywall, the insulation, I mean, drip edge, valley metal, flashing, all that stuff is not going to fit into the back of a pickup truck. So that would be incorrect. <laughs> and um, we're definitely going to need a little more than that in there, right? So now let's look at this. We've got drywall labor minimum, which Xactimate's going to spit that out on its own. Um, I'm going to show you some things in, when we get into the estimating on how I sort of deal with that. That's a little bit differently. So you see a grand total area breakdown of all the areas, all the walls and floors, all the exterior walls, and then the roofing area right here. And then this is a trade summary, content manipulation, demolition, drywall, finished carpentry trim work, insulation. There's all the trades, and it breaks down in the columns. Line item, replacement cost total, that's the RCV before GCONP. Um, there's the ACV after the, uh, then there's the uh, non-recoverable depreciation, and then the max, you know, if incurred. Painting, roofing, soffit fascia cutter, wallpaper, again the roof sketch, and then there's all the sketches for the interior rooms. So one thing I want you to notice here is, you know, after these sketches, that's it, the end. Page 15 of, of 15, that's it. So. As you can see, our estimates are going to be much more extensive than that. You don't see any information about building codes in this estimate. You don't see any information. You don't see any photographs. Um, so I would assume that there are some photographs that are submitted to the carrier by the adjuster. It's required for them to submit photographs, but usually we don't get to see those. So I mean, you're not going to really. And sometimes they will put them there. But it's very rare, but you're not going to get to see what kind of documentation and data that this estimate is based on. So I'm just going to usually assume that the documentation is horrible, especially after you see what kind of documentation that I like to get. But I'm just going to assume that it is severely lacking. It's missing a ton of information. Um, and that's just based on the numbers. I mean, I've looked at thousands of insurance estimates uh, through the years. And I got to tell you, I, I've got it right here, my last note on this training segment. I'll just tell you, I've never seen an estimate that wasn't missing something. <laughs> I felt that that was important to mention here. Um, it, it is just another thing. was extremely rare that adjusters ever even know anything about building codes. And that is a huge part of how you win. So you just kind of have to assume that whoever wrote this has poor documentation, they, they, they don't have uh, extensive knowledge about, or any, maybe any knowledge about building codes or what's even supposed to apply. And as you can see, when we build our estimate, that's where it starts. That's, you figure out what the codes are and that becomes the rules for that particular estimate. So you can't get into writing any estimate until you first figure out what the rules are for that estimate. So usually adjusters don't take any of that into consideration. Um, so while I will say, <laughs> based on the, the volume of State Farm estimates that I've seen, and, and based on kind of how they are recently, you know, it's one of the better State Farm estimates. Um, I'm relieved when I see this starting out because they already have overhead and profit. And so we don't have that uphill climb. Uh, usually I've got to demonstrate why they have to pay for overhead and profit. But in this case, they have overhead and profit. They have, um, they've applied coverage to the interior. So that tells me that the adjuster actually walked inside. I mean, usually the adjusters will only go where the property owner shows them that they've noticed damage. And, and maybe in this case, the client noticed the damage and wanted to point that out to the adjuster. But it's very rare that you run into an adjuster that actually goes and inspects every room, closet, and hallway in the property, and like up in the attic, and does a real thorough, you know, front, right, rear, left, 
elevation of, of all the elevations of the property and then all the unattached structures, the fences, and all of the collateral damage throughout. It's, it's rare that the adjuster is going to go do that all on their own, which is why we've got to be there. We've got to be there to point out all the things that we've noticed, quite frankly. So, but in this case, this is probably an estimate that was written before our involvement, you know, before the contractors even hired. And, and, and I know that you're running into, into that quite a bit too. And you kind of have to rebuild the, the file, but you're not sending it ever to the field adjuster, which we're gonna cover that, but, but just I'm gonna keep saying it throughout. Never send it to the field adjuster. That'll save you a lot of trouble. In this case, you would, you would send it, and it's right there at the top, you would send it directly to State Farm Fire Claims at statefarm.com with the subject just being the claim number. And I'll tell you with State Farm, no letters, no anything else, nothing, no RE, just, just the claim number by itself, no dashes. And a key indicator with State Farm, by the way, is you should get a return email from them confirming that they received it pretty quickly. If you don't get that, something probably went wrong. You might want to check on it. Uh, but that's it for this section. Thanks so much for watching. I hope this helped a lot of people out there. And uh, put in the work. Keep being diligent. Be willing to dive into the details. You know, perform surgery. I like to say that a lot. When you take that estimate that when you first see it for the first time, you want to perform surgery on that estimate and just investigate it and dissect it apart and take every single particle of that estimate just completely apart. I want you to understand every inch of the job the way that the adjuster understands it, but then I want you to understand it from the standpoint that you're gonna leave no stone unturned. You're gonna inspect each and every single inch of that property for damage. Uh, and we're gonna get into that, but before we do, we've gotta get into building codes, because like I said, that is the rules of the estimate. First, building codes. So next will be the building codes, but that's all for understanding an adjuster estimate. Stay tuned on this because we have a lot of case studies where we break, up, break apart a lot of adjuster estimates. And that's one of the things that I want to continue to contribute to the training, just frequently adding in adjuster estimate breakdowns. So we'll do simple ones, big ones, complex ones, lots of uh, commercial job estimates. Um, but I want to start with just a very simple one here in the basic training here. Uh, but you can check the other parts for case studies. So, and also on uh, the what's wrong with this insurance uh, estimate series. But I figured this would be a good starting point, a good uh, foundational starting point on breaking down an adjuster estimate. Again, you know, a lot of you guys know this stuff, some, some of the stuff that I've covered, but I really hope that everyone can find something in what we just covered that they can use uh, to understand these adjuster estimates. Knowledge is power. Uh, but that's all for this one. Moving on to the next one.